And so, um, as many of you know, we have been doing a sermon series on the book of Genesis, right at the beginning of the Bible, the Old Testament, and we continue in that series today. Uh, when I went to undergrad, when I, when I went to college, uh, I went to a small school down in Virginia, and it was about an hour from my hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia. My dad was a professor at the University of Virginia. And my first year, year and a half, um, I didn't have a car. And so if I wanted to get home on the weekends, I would have to get a ride with um, someone who lived in Charlottesville and happened to be heading back home that weekend. And um, I happened to know a, uh, a girl named Monica Kraft uh, through my parents' church, uh, through youth groups. And uh, so I would often get rides back with Monica. And uh, on one of the rides back, uh, a friend of hers accompanied us, uh, a girl named Sue. Sue had shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, attractive young lady. And on that first uh, trip with Sue back to Charlottesville, she uh, shared with us over the course of the hour um, how heartbroken she was over her recent breakup with her boyfriend. She had been in a uh, pretty serious long-term relationship and had just broken up. And so we just listened to her as she just poured out her heart to us over about an hour. And uh, she remarked at one point in the conversation, I just wish someone would love me. And as she said that, I heard the words of an old song running through my head, um, a song by a guy named Larry Norman. It goes like this. If I could find someone who really cared for me, someone to share my love and keep me company, if I could find someone, I'd let them take control. <coughs> and in exchange for love, I'd give my very soul. If I could find someone who really loved me, would really love me right. They'd make my life complete. They'd make my soul shine bright. I've looked around the world. I've walked down every street. Still, I can't find no one to give me what I need. It's such a lonely life. I almost cry each night because faith has put me on the shelf. I get so lonely by myself. You know, my conversation with Sue haunted me for quite some time. On a subsequent ride home with Monica, uh, one in which Sue was not present, Monica shared with me how uh, recently Sue had begun receiving bouquets of roses from a secret admirer. So many, in fact, that her entire dorm room was full of roses. When she was asked by her roommate and her friends who the mystery man was, she kind of smiled secretly and said she had no idea. They were later to discover that Sue actually had been purchasing the roses for herself. Now both Sue's lament and the words of Larry Norman's song echo the almost universal cry of the human heart to be in relationship, to be loved by someone. And it's a need that's rooted in creation itself. Turn with me, if you will, um, to Genesis chapter 2. Um, we'll also be um, putting those passage up on the screen as well. Uh, Genesis 2, verses 15 to 24. Okay. Moses writes, uh, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. 
I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become so let's take a look at this passage and what it can tell us about our need for a relationship as well as about the institution and purpose of marriage. Verse 18 says, The Lord God said it is not good for man to be alone. Genesis tells us that both men and women are created in the image of God and thus called to reflect his character, his nature. And so last week, we looked at how Adam's activities mirrored those of God's. Well, here too, in their need for relationship, men and women emulate the triune God, who himself enjoys perfect fellowship between Father, Son, and Spirit. So we were created for relationship, and many people struggle with a deep-seated ache to be loved and cherished a longing to find someone to meet that need. In fact, our culture teaches us through numerous romantic comedies, romance novels, and Walt Disney movies that our <laughs> deepest emotional and existential needs will be met when we find that right person, that soulmate. And so many people go through life looking for that special person um, who will fulfill them and give their life meaning. I submit to you, however, that what our culture peddles is a lie. If you look for another human being to fill that ache and give your life meaning and joy, you will be disappointed. Those deep longings that we all feel to be loved and cherished, to be understood, must first be met in God. He is the only one who can truly fulfill them. Only once our need for existential meaning, our need for, se uh, for a sense of self-worth, only, only once they've first been met in God are we then in the best possible place to seek a lifelong relationship with someone else. Perfect love, the Bible tells us, casts out all fear. And so only by knowing first the perfect love of God can we be free uh, to pursue human love, free from the fear of rejection. So men and women were created first to be, relation, to be in relationship with their Heavenly Father, and only secondarily to be in relationship with one another. That having been said, verse 18 reminds us that it's not good for man, we might add, woman, to be alone. Now by referring to a man being united to his wife, verse 24 makes it clear that one of the primary institutions that God has created to meet mankind's need for relationship is marriage. In fact, it makes it clear that this passage is speaking specifically of marriage. Okay, so what else does it say about the institution of marriage? Verse 19 tells us that God formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. Now, in contrast uh, to verse 21, I'm sorry, in contrast, verse 21 tells us that the Lord God caused the man to fall into a sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Right? As I've mentioned before, 
This uh, story is in sharp contrast to much pagan thought at the time. In many ancient pagan creation accounts, woman isn't derived from the same substance as man, but rather from an inferior things. Okay? This fact, as well as Genesis' assertion that women also were created in the image of God, tended to raise the status of women. For instance, ancient law codes of the time, like the Code of Hammurabi, treated women as property. And any heart, harm to them was handled in the same way that harm to property was handled. In contrast, the Old Testament Mosaic Law, uh, in the words of Old Testament scholar Doug Stewart, represented a quantum leap ahead ethically. Its prohibition of murder, for instance, found in Exodus 20.13, makes no distinction between the life of a man or a woman. And why does God use Adam's rib? Well, Sumeria was an ancient civilization. It's actually um, uh, Abraham came from Sumeria. Okay, uh, the Sumerian word for rib also means life. Okay, so Genesis asserts that men and women were created to be in relationship with each other, but this is not to be a relationship between a master and a slave but rather a relationship between two equals, both created in the image of God. Some husbands within the Christian community need to be reminded of this fact. Okay, we should never belittle or look down on our spouse, but rather cherish and respect one another. Let's continue. Verse 23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. The Hebrew word for woman and the Hebrew word for man sounds similar. That's, what he's, that's what's being referred to here. If that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now in Judaism, one of the greatest loyalties that could possibly exist was between a son and his parents. If you look at the Ten Commandments, for instance, they're structured according to the preeminence of relationships. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. Then comes our obligation to respect our parents. And only then do we get to our obligations to our neighbors. Okay? And the fact that a man is to leave his father and mother and be united to a wife to become one flesh with her points to the truth that marriage is to be the closest relationship that can exist between a man and a woman so close that it takes precedence over other important relationships, even those to family. When you get married, your chief allegiance is to your spouse, okay? Not to your parents. Sometimes in-laws can be pretty tough on spouses, mother-in-laws in particular. <laughs> I actually have an, I actually have an amazing mother-in-law. Whenever she's around, all I have to do is she's like old school. I I, pit, I put myself in a recliner and I just sit back, and she comes by every ten minutes and asks me if I'd like something else to eat. It's amazing. She's awesome. But if you are a husband, folks, it is your job to not let your wife get chewed up by your mom. Okay. I would argue also that when you have children, your chief allegiance remains to your spouse. Okay? There are married Christians who refrain from sexual affairs, but nevertheless allow themselves to develop a close emotional attachment to a coworker. They basically have an emotional crush. If you are a married person, you need to guard against developing emotional attachments to members of the opposite sex. Okay? I generally don't pray with women because prayer is something that generates intimacy. Okay? In Matthew 19, verse 4 to 6, Jesus, in commenting on this very same passage, says that marriage is to be for life. Right? He says, whatever, therefore, God has joined together, let no man separate. In addition, Genesis talks of Adam having only one wife. The Kabbalah notwithstanding, some, some myths talk about Adam having a first wife, Lilith, 
a second wife, Adam. No. Okay? In addition, Genesis talks in... What? In addition, Genesis talks of Adam, okay, as you mentioned, having only one wife, right? He doesn't talk of him having multiple wives. And so because of such passages and others, Christianity has taught and upheld the notion of monogamy from the very beginning. Not, not as merely a cultural institution, but as something that is rooted in the very nature of creation itself, right? And again, it's to be the closest relationship that can exist between a man and a woman. In verse 18, God declares, I will make a helper suitable for him. This word helper is used often in the Old Testament to refer. I'm being his helper right now. So just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do pray for women, but only, you know, when somebody else is there. <laughs> <laughs> women, you know, they're... <laughs> right. Oh, you're behind. Clarify that. <laughs> 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 helper! Yes. Helper. <laughs> so, uh, this word helper is, used, is often used in the Old Testament to refer to God himself, particularly <clears throat> in the Psalms, right? Well, what is Eve to do? Well, she's to help Adam fulfill the task God gave him of cultivating and guarding the Garden of Eden. Right? Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for works that he prepared in advance for us to do. Do you understand that God has designed you to function in a particular way and that he has work set aside for you? So that is where we get this whole idea, Christian idea, of vocation or calling. Okay? Now our culture teaches us that marriage primarily exists to meet our sexual, emotional, and spiritual needs. Scripture, however, this passage being one of them, teaches us that first and foremost, marriage exists to help us more effectively carry out the work God has given us to do. Okay? This is why dating someone who isn't a follower of Jesus isn't a great idea. Because you're both operating from two fundamentally... Oh, I got really quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> but, because you're, you're functioning from two fundamentally different ways of looking at life. In such a relationship, you will either grow closer to God and further away from your significant other, or you will grow closer to them and further away from God. So if you believe in missionary dating, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> just saying. Right? It's hard, just for instance, it's hard enough uh, for two people who are committed followers of Jesus and dating to abstain from sexual involvement. Okay? It's virtually impossible if one person in the relationship couldn't care less about sexual purity. So when considering someone as a potential spouse, one of the first questions you should ask yourself is, will they make me more effective at pursuing God's calling on my life? I got married in part because I felt that I could more effectively serve as a pastor if I were married than if I were single. I felt like I could relate to more people. I mean, there's a whole other thing about sex. That, of course, was... <laughs> Look, I, the truth is sex is 5% of marriage, okay? But oh, what a 5%. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry, buddy. <laughs> so it's very popular today. Um, so it's, I'm sorry. Some of you are like, man, I, my kid goes to this church? Aren't there any other churches in Ithaca? 
So it's very popular today to argue that gender is merely a social construct, okay? That society and culture create gender roles. Thus, the difference in behavior between men and women, it's often argued, uh, are entirely a result of social conventions. Little boys tend to play with trucks because it's what's expected, and their parents gave them trucks to play with. Little girls tend to play with dolls because, again, society expects it of them, and their parents only gave them dolls to play with. Furthermore, it's argued that since gender and the expectations that go along with it are imposed on us by society, they're not inherent to who we are as individuals. Therefore, there's no real difference between men and women. It's argued that gender is, in fact, fluid, right? That we can change our gender like we would a coat. Well, in contrast, this passage provides a markedly different perspective. Rather than merely something imposed on us by social norms, Genesis asserts that gender is, in fact, rooted in the very nature of creation itself. God created us as male and female. Therefore, gender is something that is an inherent part of who we are as individuals. Men and women are not merely blank slates upon whom society has imposed their respective genders. And in fact, while disciplines such as sociology and much popular psychology have been beating the drum that gender is merely a social construct, study after study from the field of biology and neurobiology have proven just the opposite. Men and women possess inherent differences. Recent studies have shown for the first time that the brains of men and women are actually wired differently. So Genesis is saying that God created men and women, created them to be different from each other, in part because they each possess different <coughs> strengths that, when united, complement one another. The strength of a relationship between a man and a woman is that, generally speaking, together, they possess more than they would apart. This is one of the reasons why marriage can make us more effective in pursuing God's calling on our life. So this passage from Genesis and, and Jesus' commentary on it in Matthew teach us that we were created, that God created us as sexual beings, men and women. Our identities as such are rooted in creation and that we are designed for marriage with one another. Now it's a marriage that's to be with one person, sexually exclusive, and for life. In addition, it teaches us that one of marriage's chief purposes is to help us more effectively worship God and carry out his work. Okay? So what does this mean for us? This view of marriage flies in the face of both societal opinion and actual practice. According to one recent study, by the age of 20, 75% of Americans have had premarital sex. And by the age of 44, that number has risen to 95%. Surveys indicate that one-third of all marriages end in, div in divorce. So in the age of Tinder and friends with benefits, the whole idea of saving ourselves for a lifelong, exclusive relationship seems to be about as relevant as payphones. There's the idea common today that marriage between a man and a woman is just one type of relationship among many equally valid types. It's just one possible entree on a buffet table with unlimited other entrees. Genesis, however, asserts that God designed us specifically for this type of relationship, and therefore it's better than any of the options. In fact, the research shows that it is. Study after study has shown that far from being just one option among many equally valid options, it is in fact better for not just those involved, but for children and society at large. Time doesn't permit me today to go into all of the research, but if you're interested, I'd be glad to pass it on to you. <coughs> children who live, in, uh, who live with two biological parents, for instance, uh, who are in a lifelong committed relationship do better on almost every indicator than children from broken homes. Marriage is one of the greatest wealth generating institutions that exist today. Married couples over the course of their relationship earn four times more 
than unmarried couples. Marriage greatly reduces the crime rate by civilizing men. <laughs> Folks, there's a reason that 95% of the prison population is male. Okay. One multidisciplinary study comparing the advantages of, of monogamy over polygamy worldwide found that marriage reduced a man's overall criminal likelihood by 35% and reduced the likelihood of property and violent crime by is just one of many equally valid options. God created many of us to be in a long-term monogamous relationship, and therefore that's the type of relationship that is going to most fully meet our needs. And what about those who spent years unsuccessfully looking for a spouse and are at a point in their lives where they're facing the possibility that they might never find someone? Marriage in the popular culture, as I said, is seen primarily as existing to meet our emotional, sexual, and even our existential needs. We're taught that there's one person in the world who will complete us, and if we don't find that person, we'll live through life as half a person. And many Christian singles can relate to the words of the song I referenced in my introduction, right? It's such a lonely life. I almost cry each night. I get so lonely by myself, and they've been asking God for years. The first thing that I would say to you, if you're in that situation, and, and it's, you know, I don't in any way want to diminish the pain, and uh, it's a, not an easy place to be in, but the first thing I would say to you is that the idea that you can't be a whole person unless you find a spouse is a lie. We only have to look at the life of Jesus Christ to know that. He was the only completely self-actualized, perfect person in history, yet he lived and died as someone who never married. Many singles have this idea, if only I could get married and find that right person, then I wouldn't have any more troubles. That this deep, abiding longing I have for, command, for companionship and relationship will be filled. Well, I think marriage is a wonderful gift from God. I'm here to tell you that the only one who can fill that hole is God. And so as you continue to look for that person, you know, to look for that spouse, continue to push into God, okay, to develop your relationship with Him. It will make you that much more ready for a relationship when it does come along. Or it will give you the grace and joy to lead life as a single. <coughs> And often, the longer we go without finding that person, we're apt, okay, uh, step back. Often, um, if you're in that situation, you know, if we're in that situation where we've been looking, uh, it seems like for years, without success to find uh, that uh, significant other, often we're tempted then to compromise, okay? To say, gosh, you know, I know he's not really into Jesus or, you know, yeah, I know he's got that little drinking problem. Okay? I, and I would just encourage you not to compromise when it comes to a spouse. That ultimately that only leads to heartbreak. So, um, will you pray with me? So, Father, um, Lord, we do thank you for, um, the gift of marriage. Father, we do also pray for those who are part of this community who are looking for um, uh, someone to be married to, Lord, and we ask that you would give them grace, that, Father, you would bless them, uh, that, Father, that you would answer the cries of their heart, and that, Father, um, until, uh, Lord, that time when you bring someone along where we ask that you would just draw close to them and, and fill them with your joy and your, uh, your peace in your life. And Father, we do, um, uh, Lord, ask for your strength, Lord, we, uh, in, in pursuing your best, Father, in regards to relationships. Lord, it's a, we live in a society that is... Um, coming unhinged. 
And Lord, we need your help, uh, Lord, to pursue sexual purity and wholeness. And Lord, fidelity to, uh, to our spouses, Lord. And, and uh, we need your help and strength to uh, achieve sexual purity uh, as single people. And Lord, to honor you with our bodies and in our minds. Father, thank you again for the gift of marriage. Amen. Amen. So we do have um, uh, some next steps for us to um, consider this week. And at this point, I'd like to invite the, um, the worship team forward, as well as those people who will be uh, receiving the offer today. And so one thing that you could consider doing this week is to read uh, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 12. That's the, um, the passage that I referenced in which Jesus comments on the text in Genesis we looked at today. Uh, something else that you can consider, if you're currently in a relationship with someone, um, ask yourself uh, whether you're honoring God in that relationship. If you're not, if you're struggling to honor God in the relationship you're in, I would encourage you to schedule uh, a time to meet with me or one of the elders. You know, Fred, Siri, Sergio. Um, also, there was a third next step there. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, are you seeking for your sense of self-worth and identity in another person rather than God? If so, uh, I would encourage you to push into God this week and see if he can't meet that need. I know when I, I was in a very serious relationship as a young man and got out of it and committed to not dating for five years. And it was very, I still remember how difficult it was for me to go from having somebody, um, you know, to not. And I remember um, kind of talking to myself and saying, you know what, um, I believe in my head that God can meet my emotional needs and my spiritual needs, that need for, for relationship. I believe that theoretically, but I need to find, I need to discover whether that's really true. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. And he did. He is able to, to meet you where you are.